In today's Torah portion, we read about the attempted sacrifice of Isaac. Yesterday, we read about the birth of Isaac and the eventual expulsion of Hagar and Yishmael, Abraham's other wife and child, from the camp. Yesterday's text is troublesome on many levels. The obvious ethical issue is how could Abraham accede to the demands of Sarah to expel the other wife and child? How unfair could it be? Yet perhaps the real reason and justification for the expulsion is lost in an attempt to sanitize the translation. You see, in the text, we read that Sarah saw Ishmael doing something with Isaac. The verb used is mitzachek. When the translation uses a primary definition and translates the word as playing, the verse reads, and Sarah saw Ishmael playing with her son Isaac. But the word mitzachek has a secondary meaning. And perhaps we believe one time its primary meaning that refers to sexual play. The translation we do not have tells us that Sarah saw Ishmael engaging in sexual play with her son Isaac. If the second translation is correct, and there is no reason to believe it is not, can you blame Sarah for wanting to remove a potent threat to the well-being of Isaac? Yet we find Abraham reticent to remove the danger from the camp. Yesterday's text shows that God had to intervene to save Isaac. In this, God acts as Abraham's instructor. And in this important part of Abraham's education, as the first patriarch of our people, we must protect those most vulnerable from predation. Today brings us to the conclusion and climax of Abraham's education. Yesterday, he learned that children must be protected from predators. Today, he found that child sacrifice is no longer acceptable in the covenant. From these two days of texts, we learn that one of our greatest responsibilities is to our children, and by extension, to those most vulnerable who need defense. And Abraham needs to learn this lesson for his reaction to seeing one beloved child place the other in danger is at best ambivalent. Have you ever heard of an if by whiskey speech? Come on, this is DC, you haven't heard? It's actually a well-known political phrase, evidently not in Potomac. <laughs> It refers to what we would call calculated ambivalence. Fuller Warren, a governor of Florida in the 1950s, was running for office in a year that counties were voting their local option on permitting the sale of liquor. Asked his position on wet versus dry, he would say, if by whiskey you mean the water of life that cheers men's souls, that smooths out the tensions of the day, that gives gentle perspective to one's view of life, then put my name on the list of fervent wets. But if by whiskey you mean the devil's brew that rends families, destroys careers, and ruins one's ability to work, then count me in the ranks of the dries. Now we can smile at this example for we do recognize that most politicians try to live in a world of verbal ambivalence. But we're not so different. Think how often we choose ambivalence because it is safer. Warren knew the consequences of taking a stand. He might lose his office. So he knowingly, in self-deprecation and with calculation, let it be known that he would not take a stand. He would cheerfully take contradictory positions depending on the circumstance. He did not want to make waves, for he saw what happened to another Floridian named Claude Pepper, one of the most outspoken liberals in the Senate, who was placed on a hit list. They nicknamed him the Red Pepper. It was revealed that he was a known 
extrovert. <laughs> His sister was a thespian. But worse, his brother was a practicing homo sapien. <laughs> In school, he matriculated. And worst of all, he practiced celibacy before marriage. Th this is all true, by the way. Well, I don't know if he did that, but at least that's what was said about him. Naturally, many were horrified, and he was voted out of office. Calculated ambivalence keeps you safe, but does not foster the development of values in our society, in our culture, or in our families. There are times when ambivalence is a useful tool and can be a positive force, but if it becomes the norm in our relationships, it can create toxic communities. While we are all ambivalent at different times in our lives, our identity is in great part determined by when and how we choose to be so. Yesterday, we met an Abraham who was ambivalent in his response to the abuse of his son. God intervened and taught the lesson that no matter who the perpetrator, no matter how much you love them or what they produce, no matter how powerful they are, if Jewish values are to mean anything, then they require that we take a stand for a value is only a value when it is tested. It's all a matter of perspective. Do you see your faith and values as something to be practiced only when convenient or easy, but discarded when it becomes difficult or problematic? Or do you see them as a way of life that guides us on correct paths? Three stonecutters are employed building a cathedral. When the first was asked what he was doing, angrily he replied, fool, can't you see I'm cutting stones? The second replied wearily, I'm earning a living for my family. But the third one said joyfully, I'm building a great cathedral. Today, though, Abraham cannot be accused of calculated ambivalence. He's given his task by God to sacrifice your son. And he can't wait, regardless of the human consequence, Disregarding what the effect would be on the child's mother, Abraham gets going. Perhaps he wanted to make up for his ambivalence of yesterday. Perhaps he recognized his ethical lapse. Whatever the reason, three days later, he finds himself up the mountain with a bound Isaac, knife in hand, and about to sacrifice his son. So we come to the angel. Up on that mountain, the angel stops Abraham complimenting him on his willingness to perform the deed and promising him the covenantal continuity. The angel appears in cameo, but the angel is crucial to the story. For the angel's task is to open the eyes of our patriarch, and that is exactly what the text tells us. Abraham opens his eyes and sees the ram to replace his son. In yesterday's portion, an angel opened Hagar's eyes to see the well of water that will save her life and the life of her son. With Abraham, the angel opens Abraham's eyes so that he does not kill his son Isaac. That's what angels do in the Torah. They open people's eyes to see what is before them. They force you to look at what is in front of you and refuse to let you slide away into ambivalence. One thing is sure, when you meet an angel, your life will no longer be the same. Now, no one ever said that angels are warm or cuddly. There is no description of an angel having compassion or sympathy, just the opposite. They are portrayed as being devoid of feelings. They perform their tasks and they leave. According to rabbinic interpretation, the angel opened Abraham's eyes not only to see the ram that would replace his son, but also that the altar built for the sacrifice would become the foundation of a tradition that is ours to this very day. Abraham's destiny, if he could reach his potential, would change the world. And at the moral foundation of the tradition was a realization that Abraham had made two great mistakes. The first was not protecting Isaac from the predator that was his older brother. And the second was not protecting Isaac from God. 
For I believe that God wanted Abraham to argue against the sacrifice as he did before God in defense of Sodom. If, after all, Abraham could defend people condemned because they were evil, how could he not protest when an innocent life was at stake? After today's episode, the text tells us that Abraham descends from the mountain alone. He buries his wife and sets about arranging a marriage for Isaac, but he never talks to God again. Nor does the text ever suggest that he spoke to Isaac again. Abraham's calculated ambivalence imperiled his son's life, the son who would carry on the covenant. But we forgive him for this. He was, after all, human. And as humans, we are entitled to make mistakes. That's why we are given this day. That's why we are given a day to practice teshuva, repentance. And Abraham does what he can to regain his life and rectify what he can. And I believe this is one of the greatest lessons of all. You cannot change the past and you cannot erase the pain of those you have hurt, but you can change your life and your life's choices and in doing so, change theirs for the better. I have spent years learning how to fix life, only to discover at the end of the day that life is not broken. We are. Life is life. We can affect healing by making peace with life. You cannot master life or control it, for control is only a fantasy. In its place, we have to learn that we are never completely broken as long as we have each other. You can successfully navigate a life with calculated ambivalence. You can make friends and raise a family. You can be a participating member of the community as well. But there are consequences. You will never have the intimacy that comes from creating strong bonds with others that will endure heartache and heartbreak. And on this day, you will be called to account for all those things you could have done but did not. A famous rabbi of the Talmud named Zusia was dying, and with his tears over his imminent demise, his students asked him why he was crying. Wasn't he content with his life as it had been. And his response calls to us from centuries ago. He said, when I die and stand before God, I will not be asked, why didn't you act like Abraham? Or why weren't you more like Moses? Rather, I will be asked, why weren't you the Zusia you could have been? And for that, I will have no answer. And with calculated ambivalence, you will never meet an angel. Rather, you will meet them, but you will never recognize them for what they are. Angels exist in all forms and come in all sizes. An angel doesn't have to be a divine being. Rather, an angel is someone you come in contact with, perhaps for only a few seconds, perhaps only once in your life, who has the potential to set you on a straighter path and give you direction. They are not always friendly, but they serve a vital purpose by bringing catharsis into our lives. They will challenge you. They will open your eyes if you are willing and able to recognize the moments of revelation. If you're willing to be shaken from your calculated ambivalence, they will change your life and facilitate your changing the lives of those around you. We are a religion replete with symbols. These symbols are meant to guide us and keep us on the right path. The shofar sounds and we are called to repent. The wine symbolizes the joy of life and of the tradition. The candles symbolize the presence of God. These symbols were meant to speak to us in a dialogue that spans thousands of years. In a very real sense, these symbols 
are constant angelic reminders of who we are and what we can be. But I have found at moments of decision, at the nexus points in our lives, when we most need the angels to guide us, ambivalence robs us of the ability to see the import of those moments. And with these moments denied, we end up lost, unable to perceive any path in front of us. Those who are lost and in pain are unaware of and unable to identify the symbols around them. They are too caught up in the despair of the moment to look for deeper meaning. That is sad. For the shofar is meant to show us the direction that on this day we can rise to the level of Abraham making mistakes but learning from the angels around us. On a deeper level, people are symbols as well. We are all of us, each and every one, born with the potential to be an angel for those around us. The tradition teaches us that we blow a shofar, a ram's horn, on Rosh Hashanah to wake us up and repent, but I think that there might be another reason. The shofar reminds us, it reminds me, that to find the ram, Abraham's eyes had to be opened, and he had to be willing to see what the angel was showing him. And when I hear the shofar blown, it reminds me to look for the angels in my life and in the community, and that perhaps I will be an angel for someone as well. You know, human being, the phrase human being, is more a verb than a noun. Each of us is unfinished, a work in progress. Each of us is broken in some way, but it pays to remember that life is a process and being broken is but one state of that process. And one lesson learned is that it is never too late to be who you were meant to be.